Hello out there in Facebook. My name is Sandra Wick. I'm glad you could join us today. So if you could give us a smiley face, give us a thumbs up. We're glad that you're joining us today. Um, I am the crop production agent in the Post Rock Extension District of K-State Research and Extension. We'll adjust the camera just a little bit so both of us are on here. Uh, we just got finished with one of our weed herbicide meetings. Uh, part of that training included the dicamba training for producers. Um, and we have with us today Dr. Dallas Peterson. He is one of our weed specialists from K-State Research and Extension. And so Dallas has been doing several of these dicamba training. So you might just kind of start out kind of where you're at with all the trainings this spring. Okay. Well, thanks, Sandra. It is nice to be here uh, with you today. We're about halfway through, I guess, our planned dicamba training uh, programs throughout the state. Uh, we K-State Research and Extension, at least, uh, has about 50 of those scheduled. I myself have about 30 of those scheduled, and I'm about halfway through. In addition to K-State Research and Extension, uh, the registrants for these new dicamba products are also providing training. So Monsanto, uh, DuPont, and BASF also have some trainings throughout the state. And the reason for so many trainings is that if you want to apply one of the new dicamba products, Extendamax, Fexapan, or Ingenia, uh, dicamba or oxen-specific training is a requirement uh, if you want to apply those. So again, we have a lot of applicators, both commercial and private applicators, that may wish to do that. And in order to do that, they have to undergo this mandatory training. Okay. Okay, so it's pretty much answered the question, kind of the summary of why the additional training for dicamba this year, because the license for the Extend Sui Beans ends the end of 2018. Is that correct? Well, yeah, maybe we should take a step back, actually, and talk about why the training is required. Exactly. Last year was the first year of the full commercialization of the new Extend crop technology. That's soybeans and cotton that are resistant to dicamba herbicide. Dicamba is not a new herbicide. It's been around for 50 years. Uh, it was initially introduced as Banville herbicide and then later Clarity herbicide. And we've used a lot of those herbicides through the years on different crops like corn and sorghum and wheat and in our wheat stubble. But they've never been used in soybeans and cotton before. We also know from the past that non-extend soybeans are extremely susceptible uh, to dicamba. Now, it's only the new dicamba products that are approved for use on the extend crops, and it was hoped that with these new products that have lower volatility, we wouldn't have as many issues uh, with non-target injury as we might have had with the older products. Unfortunately, uh, throughout all the soybean growing areas, there was a lot of injury, dicamba injury, to non-extend soybeans. And, and consequently, uh, that's why the training is now required, along with a number of other additional label requirements. And as you indicated, the initial registration for these products was just a two-year registration. And they did that because of concerns with off-target injury, we hoped that it wouldn't be that severe. It was much worse than we had anticipated. And EPA has said if things don't improve this coming season, there is a good chance that these products may not be renewed or re-registered. And that was going to be one of my questions, too. What happens at the end of this year? And I'm assuming uh, all the reports or claims and the applications will be evaluated, and then they're just going to have to see what happens at the end of this year. It, it really is a big unknown. Uh, okay. You know, again, we had widespread issues last year. Again, maybe we didn't follow all the label guidelines as, should, as well as we should have. Maybe we had a false sense of security with the newer low volatile formulations. Uh, but regardless, we had more issues than we wanted. We don't know what you know, constitutes better this year than right. last year. Uh, but again, if we st still have the widespread problems, I think, you know, there are concerns about getting it re-registered. Okay. And this dicamba training it, it is really because there, there was some confusion on who was required to have the dicamba training. Um, and it is just certain formulations of the dicamba on top of that as well. And it's only to the extent soybeans. You can use it on other products, kind of like you indicated earlier. 
Well, actually, last year there were no requirements okay. for training. Again, we tried to educate, I would say, you know, our growers and applicators as to what the use guidelines were. There still may have been some misunderstandings about buffers and when you can spray and when you can't spray and uh, all of that. So this year the training uh, is required. In terms of other dicamba products, it's only the new products, okay, that are approved for use on Extend Crops. And uh, these guidelines, a lot of these guidelines and restrictions that we are talking about only pertain to those new products. They have been reclassified as restricted-use pesticides, so they can only be purchased by a certified applicator. And again, you have to have this training uh, to make the application. The older dicamba products, the Banville, the Clarity, the, the Sterling Blues, and all the other generic products, they are not yet classified as restricted-use pesticides. They may be in the future, okay? And so, again, uh, a lot of the requirements that we were talking about specifically to extend the max and Genia and Fexpan do not necessarily apply to those, although I think what we're talking about is still good background information when using those products as well. Okay. Uh, and the reason why I ask that is because there's been lots of questions that have come into our offices, like who's required to have it? Can I still spray the other formulations of the of dicamba? So hopefully that clarification has, or we've answered the questions of those producers then, and who we, needs the training and who doesn't? We've tried, okay? And again, we're kind of learning as right. we go as well, and it varies from state to state. Uh, each state uh, had the has the right to come up with their own rules and regulations even above and beyond what's on that federal label and the training was also left up to the states and so it's not consistent everywhere. Kansas for example has uh, stated that they will accept training from the surrounding adjacent states uh, however uh, Nebraska has not unless it gets approved. Uh, Missouri does not accept Kansas training because they have additional requirements uh, that their department FAG has implemented. So uh, I think with Oklahoma, you know, it, we have reciprocity between the two states. Mm -hmm. We're still learning uh, as we're working our way through this process. This is kind of a new deal for us right. in many regards. Okay. And I'm glad you mentioned that about the reciprocal agreement because we, you know, since we're close to right. Nebraska up here, we have several people that maybe it's closer for them to do the training up in Nebraska mm -hmm. and they wanted to know, but they uh, treat and spray their fields down here in Kansas. Or both so, sides or both. of the border, right. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So that's a good. Plus, I kind of wanted to mention, it seems like I think when you mentioned last year, north central Kansas up there tended to be the hot spot, I guess you could say, for claims of maybe some di damage from the, uh, to the non-dicamba beans. Is that kind of where you have seen that? I think that's true, okay. and there are several reasons for that. I think uh, historically we haven't grown a lot of soybeans in western Kansas, but right. it definitely has increased. Right. But also historically, we've almost always seen a little dicamba injury right. on our soybeans in western Kansas because we use so much of it right. on our wheat stubble. Uh, where we had the greatest issues, I think, where there was a concentration of extend soybeans planted. And so consequently, there were a lot more dicamba applications during the critical periods. And that's, again, after the soybeans are up and growing, and especially when they start to get close to that bloom stage of growth. So if there were a lot of uh, extend soybeans planted in a given area, mm -hmm. there were a lot more dicamba applications, say, in mid-June, uh, when we had other non-extend soybeans in that area, and they were just vulnerable to that. And in many cases, you could not tell where the source of the injury came from. Uh, because, again, there may have been multiple applications in the area. It doesn't show up oftentimes for one to three weeks after the okay. application occurred. And so, again, just very difficult uh, to, to assess. All righty. Well, um, I hope that that clears up some of the questions on dicamba training and what's required. Um, if you do have additional questions, don't hesitate to give us a call at any of our offices in the Post Rock District, um, which would be in uh, Lincoln, Mankato, Osborne, Smith Center, or Beloit. So um, don't hesitate to give us a call. And then if we don't know the answers, we can easily call the expert, Dallas. Well. <laughs> I don't have all the answers either, and I tell our four farmers that. There's still, again, there are a lot of questions uh, about what happened and why it happened. And even regarding the label, in some cases, it's not real clear-cut uh, with the terminology. Okay.
All righty, well, we're going to switch gears just a little bit uh, because of the, uh, the other part of our uh, meeting today was uh, doc Dr. Curtis Thompson. He is another one of our weed specialists with K-State Research and Extension. And we also covered some uh, control or weed recommendations for uh, the upcoming spring uh, growing season, corn, grain sorghum, and soybeans as well. So we're going to shift gears just a little bit because I know the weed resistance, weed herbicide resistance issue has always come up the last few years. Is that still an issue here and what kind of weeds are we talking about? Well, it certainly is still an issue and it's not a new issue. It's right. been here for a long time but it continues to get worse and uh, we really got spoiled with glyphosate and Roundup Ready crops because that was really an easy solution. It was inexpensive, it was highly effective, you didn't have to worry about herbicide carryover. But again, we abused the technology. We used it too much, and we didn't use integrated uh, approaches, and we didn't spray it when we needed to. And all of those things have led to more and more problems with glyphosate-resistant weeds, and especially the kochia, palmer amaranth, mare's tail, uh, water hemp as we move further east. And so they have been increasingly difficult to manage. Uh, some of that, again, is just our approach. Uh, we got into some bad habits uh, when Roundup was working. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, again, we really just kind of need to take a step back, I think, and reevaluate our programs and think of it as a program, not just wait until we see the weeds out mm -hmm. there a foot and two foot tall and then go spare glyphosate. You know, that doesn't work anymore. It will right. never work again. Okay. And so, again, we just need to use more of an integrated approach. Okay. Okay, uh, so maybe not really getting into specific weed herbicides, but can you like give us some uh, management strategies just dealing with weed management maybe for 2018? Right, so again, we want to encourage an integrated approach and it really seems like we're going to have to rely a little bit more on residual herbicides than again we were when Roundup was still working. And so a lot of that depends upon when those weeds germinate and emerge and it varies quite a bit among our more serious weed issues. Uh, for example, mare's tail is a winter annual oftentimes. It comes up in the fall. If it doesn't come up in the fall, it comes up early in the spring, although it can germinate even later into the spring. So what we've learned over the years, again, is that fall applications or very early spring treatments are key for managing uh, the mare's tail. And again, we have to, of course, use a herbicide that's effective. Dicamba is one of the more effective herbicides uh, for, for mare's tail control. Kochia is a summer annual, as is Palmer amaranth, but again, they have different emergence patterns. Uh, kochia is one of the first summer annual weeds that we see germinating and coming up in the spring. And by spring, I mean sometimes mm -hmm. in February. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially if it warms up a little bit, we'll have some kochia coming up. And it seems to be able to tolerate, you know, those uh, frosts uh, at that right. time of the year. And it will continue to come up later as well, but some of our research has shown that probably 90% of all of our kochia comes up before the 1st of April. So if we want to use a residual herbicide that controls it during that germination and emergence time frame, we have to be spraying those now right. or previously almost. Right. And so we really have shifted our programs over the years to do that. And there are a number of herbicides that we can use in the different crops, uh, you know, even applied in the fall, late fall, mm -hmm. and through the winter almost into early spring uh, to do that. Uh, products that have sulfentrazone in them, uh, for example, are uh, probably the most effective uh, ahead of sunflowers, that would be Spartan herbicide, and soybeans, okay? So again, products that have the authority uh, in them are some of the most effective ones for that. Authority MTC has really been a pretty good product uh, for this part of the state as an early application mm. ahead of soybeans. Uh, in corn, uh, dicamba, again, is, is, a, is a key product there, but it's not going to last real long, so we oftentimes want to combine it with something else. Uh, so dicamba and atrazine, for example, or something that contains uh, uh, some uh, HPPD herbicide, like some Callisto in it or some Balance in it, those will help us to provide the early control as well as some residual control at least into late spring. Most of our kochia again comes up during that time frame, and then we'll have to manage it after that as well. Palmer amaranth or Palmer pigweed, however, doesn't start to come up until 
late April and into May. So that really does complicate things for us. And that means, again, we're going to have to probably be applying, you know, sequential treatments through time to try to manage all of those weeds. And I know that costs more. Right. But I always tell farmers it costs you a lot more not oh, to control right. your weeds than it does to control them. So you have to look at the options that are available to you, apply those accordingly. We've con almost gone to a point where we suggest you have to have overlapping residuals, you know, so applying some early, maybe splitting your applications and then applying more residual uh, later as we get close to planting to try to extend that residual control later into the into the okay. season. Okay. So it sounds like, okay, let me just drop the microphone. All righty. Okay, so it sounds like the key is the proper weed identification. That's the first step because you have to know that in order to know when and how to control that in the best best approach. Absolutely. And, and right. the integrated program is the key here, not just, you know, like, like you said, the old um, ideas or methods of not until the weed comes up, that really doesn't work anymore. The, the pre right. the, the pre um, application plus a post. So in kind of that old saying, I don't know which one of you guys made that up, if it was Dallas was or Kurt. Curtis, but uh, if, if you don't spray a pre, don't call me. So which is referring to a pre application and a post application, which is your integrated um, right. management approach. And so again, it all relates back to timing, right. again, in a program approach. And with your post treatments, just as you indicated, those need to be timely as well. Right. Uh, no herbicide controls big weeds like glyphosate or Roundup used to. And when we say an integrated approach, we're talking about other methods of control as well. A lot of talk these days about cover crops, for example, and cover crops can play a role in that. It's not going to be adequate by itself, but it certainly can help suppress your weeds and, and change those emergence patterns. So there are a lot of things that can uh, play into this. Tillage. A lot of us don't like tillage, right. okay, uh, but in some cases there may be an opportunity where tillage does help you manage those weeds. We have some weeds like uh, tumble windmill grass uh, that becomes problematic in no-till simply because it's a perennial that glyphosate and most herbicides are ineffective on. Sometimes our only solution is to get that undercutter out and run that uh, through that field when it's hot and dry. That seems to take care of our tumble windmill grass for several years, okay? And uh, so, again, it just you have to treat each field separately okay. and uh, try to integrate your approaches. Okay, okay. And I liked your comment about that it actually costs you more not to do yes. it because of your yield potential at the end, and that's where the bottom line is, and especially in today's uh, low commodity prices, you really need to fine tooth all your expenses and know where you're at and know the right management things that's going to get you the most yield and hopefully the most profitability. Yeah, and the other cost that we oftentimes don't think about of not controlling our weeds is that they produce more seed. And it's very much more difficult to control a lot of weeds than it is a few weeds. So, again, what you do now will affect what happens in the future as well. So, again, it's a, it's a system. It's an approach. It's long range. It's not just, you know, I need to go control what weeds I have out there right now. Okay. Okay. And before we leave soybeans, you know, you talked about the extend soybeans. And that's what a lot of people are going to, a lot of producers, because of the um, uh, dicamba that you can spray on those for weed control. But how about, like, the non-Roundup, the non-GMO? Uh, uh, is, is, are people going back to those soybeans because of the cost or not? Well, there is some of that, and as well as other GMO technologies right. as well. Liberty Link, for example, has been right. around for a while, and it wasn't very popular when Roundup was still working. But when Roundup quit working, it can work better than Roundup. Mm. So, yeah, you can use the other technologies or, you know, non-GMO crops. The principles are the same. Again, you have to manage through the season. Uh, you need to use an integrated approach. Timing is key. And so that all works the same. It's just the specific tools, I guess, that you use to do that. Kind of along the same technology lines, we'll shift to maybe sorghum a little bit, and there's yeah. some there's some new technologies in, in that seed as well uh, within the Enzen sorghum. So, can you kind of give us an update on that technology? 
Well, sorghum has always suffered from not having as many options for weed control as corn, for example, or even soybean. And so, again, weed management has been a challenge uh, through the years, and it's also a lower value crop, right. so we don't like to spend as much money on it. Uh, one technology that we have talked about for several years that you know we keep anticipating is Inzan sorghum. Uh, Inzan sorghum is a non-GMO crop, actually, but it is a a form of herbicide resistant crop. It's uh, resistant to the ALS inhibiting herbicides uh, that we haven't been able to use in sorghum below before, and so. Unfortunately, again, it just isn't coming to the marketplace mm. very fast. Uh, there are very few or limited Inzen hybrids available. Uh, apparently, it's been very difficult to breed that. Uh, there are uh, some very limited Inzen available right now, maybe more next year, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, what Inzen allows you to do is to use a herbicide called uh, Zest herbicide, uh, which uh, is an ALS inhibiting herbicide, actually similar to some that we've used in corn previously, which gives us an opportunity for some post-emergence grass control. Uh, even including shatter cane. Uh, however, again, uh, the source of that resistance mm -hmm. actually came from ALS resistant shatter cane. So stewardship is very important. Again, it's not going to work like Roundup work. Okay, so timing is key. Okay. Have to get those weeds when they're really small. Uh, you're probably going to have to tank mix it with something else uh, for the broadleaf weed control, and it's going to work best again in a sequential program with a good pre-treatment up front and then followed by a timely application of zest. Okay. You cannot use zest on any non inzen mm. sorghum. It will okay. kill it. Okay? okay, so again that's important to know. Okay, kind of like the same technology, you know, with the extend beans, you can't use a dicamba right. on non-extend soybeans. Right. So that technology works great, but you have to know what you're doing mm -hmm. and when. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, and I, I want to thank you guys for joining us. I know we covered a lot of information here for you. If you have additional questions, I forgot to grab the weed, the new chemical weed book mm -hmm. to show you, uh, but that is available at all our extension offices online. It's a 2018 K-State Research and Extension Weed Control Book, um, and, and I, I guess you could say it's like a one-step it's an encyclopedia of weed control, I guess you could say, Dallas. Um, but it is available for you, and it goes through. Um, and K State does a very nice job of l going through each of the crops, uh, l listing each of the herbicides, its effectiveness. So, is there anything else you want to add on that book? Well, we do revise it every year, so we try to keep it up to date. Although things are constantly changing, and so uh, we would. Uh, uh, remind everybody it doesn't substitute for the label, but it does have a lot of good information on it. We have efficacy tables in there for what weeds are controlled by what herbicides and then use guidelines. Uh, something that we've added just uh, in the last few years is an indication of the various herbicide sites of action, uh, which again can be important from a resistance management standpoint. We want to diversify and use different sites of action, not just rely on one. So again, we think it's a very valuable resource to help in managing your weeds. And again, we'd like to thank Dallas for joining us here and uh, with Facebook. And we know we've kept you for just a, a little bit longer. So um, it, if you like this type of programming, if you would let us know, drop us an email, give us a call at any of our extension offices in the Post Rock District, which the offices are Beloit, Lincoln, Mankato, Osborne, and Smith Center. So uh, if you go to our uh, website, it is www.postrock.ksu.edu. And th there is a Facebook link down in the left-hand corner. So you can easily link to that. So again, thanks for joining us today, and we'll talk to you later.